to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5, starting in verse 2. As I explained, sometimes the chapter breaks are in the wrong place. Verse 2 changes the thought. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. It will come about that he who is left in Zion... You're right. You're right. That was four. Okay. We'll start over. For all of you out there, I've, I've just been reprimanded. Here. But we'll do this again. Okay. It, it's actually kind of part of it, but we don't need to do that. Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it, and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. Go ahead and be seated. I hate to tell you this, but I have to delve into the realm of politics just a little bit more. Uh, that's just the material that uh, I've been given in the book of Acts. It's just the way it goes. Uh, but it also is about, uh, tonight, about the spread of the gospel and how the gospel has gone forth into all the world. It's also about the unrighteousness of man and the righteousness of God. And of course, these are all biblical themes. In fact, if we were to go through uh, the scripture from beginning to end, we would see the righteousness of God versus the unrighteousness of man is probably the major theme that we're dealing with. The success of God and his plan and the failure of man and his plan. And if you have been attending the uh, uh, series uh, that we've been doing on communism, it is just one more failure of man. There, is, uh, there are numerous countries that have tried the communist experiment, and they have all failed. Every one of them. They all come to power saying we are going to increase human freedom and dignity. And yet, they don't do that. And God says, I'm going to establish a kingdom of righteousness, and I will rule with a rod of iron. And because God is good, he can rule as an absolute dictator and increase human freedom. Sounds 
almost uh, contrary to reason, but it's the truth. Just a little bit of review tells us uh, in Acts 18.4 that we read last week. It says, he, Paul, was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. You know, unlike some other uh, religions in the world, Christianity is not spread by force. I know you'll tell me there's some people that have tried to do that in the past, and it's true, uh, but they were wrong. And we realized that the fruit of what they did didn't last. It says, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, the expected Messiah. <coughs> he was able to do that because they brought some money down uh, from Thessalonia in that area, and Paul didn't need to work for a while. But it says, when they, uh, the Jews in the synagogue, resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. I'm done preaching to you Jews, at least the ones here. He kept the same formula in his next missionary journey. He would go to the synagogue to announce to Israel, your Messiah has come. Many of them received that message, but many refused it. We don't want a Messiah that was crucified. We don't want a Messiah that paid with his blood for our sins. We want a Messiah that's going to wield a sword and, you know, come down hard on the Romans. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was right next door to the synagogue. It says, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord gave Paul a vision during this time. It says, the Lord said to Paul, in the night, by a vision, do not be afraid any longer. There's another recurring theme in the Bible. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Take courage. Be courageous. Over and over, we're told this. Go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in this city. It would seem that that promise, that no one's going to harm him, uh, applies to his ministry in Corinth uh, specifically, because he definitely does get harmed along the way. But, yes? Um, what translation are you? Is that the Septuagint translation? Most of the... Uh, uh, the quotations in the New Testament from the Old Testament are from the Septuagint. But I mean, you know, the brand there, the Rex, whatever it is. there is no New Testament Septuagint. Well, I'm just just in King James it says, uh, or your version says, don't fear any longer. King James just says, don't fear. So I'm just wondering. Uh, it has it in those cryptic letters. I just was curious about your translation. I'll look later. Uh, <clears throat> do not be afraid. Yeah, the words any longer are implied, possibly, they're uh, in uh, uh, italics, so there's not, a, uh, there's not a word or a pair of words in the Greek that says any longer. Uh, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. God knew who was going to hear the message and who would believe. And it says that Paul settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But it says, 
while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, and we know when that was. Gallio is a historical person that we know about. And he, he was proconsul of Achaia only two years, uh, from 51 to 53 AD. So we can, you know, every now and then we have a little thing that tells us exactly when these things happen. But during that time, the Jews, with one accord, rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. The governors and proconsuls and various other administrators would on occasion just uh, sit in a hall or outside and say, okay, if you have disputes, come and I'll deal with them. But my word is final, so be careful. And they brought the charge. This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, they wouldn't have brought a charge based on the Mosaic law. They would have brought a charge based upon Roman law. And the Roman law says you can't teach religions that have not been kind of reviewed and approved. And, of course, Paul is saying, I'm just, I'm just a Jew. I am teaching people that the expected Messiah has come. The Romans were pretty tolerant, basically. They, uh, uh, any time that they, they uh, conquered or colonized an area, they would say, okay, what gods do you worship? We'll even contribute statues. Of course, when they tried that in Jerusalem, the high priest ripped his clothes uh, out of his outrage that such a thought would even be had by anybody because... The first commandment says you will not make any uh, graven image. But the Romans were pretty tolerant of indigenous religions. They didn't want anything new springing up, however. But this guy, Gallio, we know from history, and we know he had a, he had a younger brother uh, who was actually a little more well-known. His name was Seneca well-known uh, Roman philosopher who was actually the tutor of Nero. And he brought up Nero to be the first great philosopher king. <laughs> Didn't work very well. We'll get into, we'll talk about Nero quite a bit later when we come to him in the book of Acts because he's in there as well. But Seneca was pretty well-known and we have uh, quite a bit of his writings still, and uh, just a few quotations that I thought were pretty interesting because we could uh, uh, we could utilize some of his uh, philosophy to this day. One of the things he said was, "If you don't know, ask." This is for Jan. If you don't know, ask. You will be a fool for the moment, but a wise man for the rest of your life. Ask questions, even if they seem dumb at the time. He says, it is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that things are difficult. He says, be wary of the man who urges an action in which he himself incurs no risk. And this is a good one. He must have been talking to some Christians. He said, God is near you, is with you is inside you. That's pretty interesting. Which, which God is he talking about? Well, he only mentions one, so he must have been talking to somebody. It was common among the, uh, the, the learned Greeks and Romans that, you know, the, the pantheon of gods, you know, uh, Mars and Jupiter and Venus and the all of those that we've named planets for, they kind of were the festivals of the calendar year. Uh, but they didn't really believe in them. Uh, in fact, e even in the mythology, none of these gods and goddesses are the creator of the human race. So, but anyway, back to Paul in his trial. He... Uh, He's about to make a defense. It says, when Paul was about to open his mouth, 
It says, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or of a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you, to listen to you, to hear your charges. He said, But if the, there are questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they were so upset, they grabbed a hold of Sosthenes, who was the replacement leader in the synagogue, or maybe a co-leader, or one of several leaders, we don't know. And it says they began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. Why they were beating him, we don't really know. Uh, possibly because they thought, well, this guy didn't make a very good accusation before the judge. You know, he was to be the prosecuting attorney and he blew it. Me, we don't know. Uh, but Paul spoke of another Sosthenes, or maybe the same one. Also in Corinth, he says, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. So evidently, Sosthenes was the amanuensis, the actual writer of 1 Corinthians. Maybe. We're not sure. We don't have enough information to be certain about that. But uh, Sosthenes is a kind of an unusual name. He's the only one I've run across in the scripture. Um, but Gallio had quite a bit of wisdom here. I mean, he could have just said, yeah, you Jews are right, he, you know, this would have been expedient. We'll just run these guys out of town or put them in jail or whatever else. He could do pretty much anything he wanted to do. But he realized, hey, this is a religious matter among the Jews. Let them handle it. Kind of like the idea of separation of church and state, right? Which is how, you know, even though those words are not in our Constitution, separation of church and state, it is an idea that the church is not to control the state. The state is not to control the church, right? The state is not to become involved in religious disputes. The state can't uh, say, well... We side with the Calvinists against the Arminians, right? Uh, they just they, we don't want to get involved in those issues at all, and that's why usually when a government entity uh, <clears throat> becomes heavy-handed against a church, the church usually wins out. Usually, sometimes you know it doesn't go the way it probably should, and that seems to be changing to some extent. But Jesus dealt with these kinds of issues, uh, political issues, as I would call them, uh, in his lifetime. He had to deal with uh, the secular government. He had to deal with his own government. And he usually totally stymied them. Jesus, in Luke 20, verse 9, tells a parable. It says, A man planted a vineyard. Sound familiar? From Isaiah, chapter 4 5? Chapter 5. Chapter 5. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He proceeded to send a third, and this one also they wounded and cast out. And the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect 
kin. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He said, He will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, May it never be. See, they recognized, they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. He used the imagery of the vineyard from Isaiah 5. The vineyard they recognized as the house of Israel, the house of Judah. May it never be. We're not going to do that. Of course, they did. But Jesus looked at them and said, What then is this that is written, the chief the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. He's asking them, what do, you, what do you think that means? The builders rejected the chief cornerstone. They knew. And he says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. They were offended. So they decided, let's set a trap for him. Let's, let's trap him into saying something that politically could be a charge that would lead to a death sentence. So Mike? Yes. Are you saying that the people Jesus was speaking to understood that he was condemning them? Oh, absolutely. It says so. Just in a minute here, you'll see it. Okay. It says so. And he was talking to the scribes and the chief priests because these are, these are the ones that say uh, that tried to lay hands on him that very hour. And they feared the people for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. They got it. And so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could deliver him to the rule and the authority of the government. And they questioned him, saying, this is uh, uh, Middle Eastern buttering up. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and that you are not partial to anybody, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery. So he, they, they, this was a, a you know a no-win situation. They thought, you know, they thought, well, if he says no, then you know, then we'll have him uh, committing a violation of Roman law because you couldn't speak ill of the governor or, or, or the emperor and the, and the uh, Roman establishment. If he said, let's see, if he said yes, okay. anyway, if he said, uh, you know, it's not lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, he was a, in the violation of Roman law, if he said, yeah, it is lawful, it's a, against the uh, uh, sentiments of the people. But he doesn't answer. He says, show me a denarius, common coin of the day worth a day's wages. He says, whose likeness and inscription does it have? He said, well, Caesar's. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And this is how we need to separate our thinking. There are things that are within the, the correct purview of the secular government. But there are also things that are not. And we have to be discerning. Now, the framers of the American Constitution were pretty much as wise as Gallio was. Gallio was a pretty smart guy. The First Amendment to the Constitution 
says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Like in England, you had the Church of England, and the King of England is the head of the church. Uh, and essentially, the church is an arm of the government. They have an established religion. And they have laws against nonconformity. You essentially, whether you believe or not, you have to pay taxes, tithes, to the church. And the same thing existed with the Roman Catholic Church throughout Europe. Uh, even if you were an unbeliever, you still had to pay tithes. And that was enforced by the state. So you not only had to pay your taxes to the state, but you had to pay your tithe to the church that you didn't agree with, Monica. So is the Queen of England today the head of the Anglican Church? Yes. Really? Yep. There are still taxes every... Oh, no. It's, it's a ceremonially... She's a figurehead at this point, but they, yeah. that's still a title. But, but people, the money? Do people, people don't have to pay tithes to okay. the Church of England anymore. I'm not sure exactly when that ended, but it was still happening during Victoria's rule uh, in the 1800s. So she was a reformer. She probably put an end to that. I don't know. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, no established church. That's reasonable. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably uh, to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So we have separation of church and state, but that does not mean that people of a particular faith should be excluded from any government post. And like Gallio, the, the uh, framers of the Constitution really said, you know, issues of religion need to be taken care of outside of government. We have had some situations recently where government is in fact, attempting to dictate uh, the uh, religious beliefs or punish the religious beliefs of certain people. We can think about some uh, uh, photographers in New Mexico that refuse to do a photography job for a gay wedding. We have the guy in Colorado that refused to bake a cake for a gay wedding. These are matters of conscience, but we see that uh, governments are attempting to impose their views upon people's, uh, on matters of conscience. Fortunately, the guy in Colorado has won his case more than once. They keep coming back and trying to refile it, word it a little bit differently, and uh, fortunately, he has good financial backing because he can afford to defend himself. That's fortunate. Uh, you might not be able to defend yourself. Uh, but we have this thing working its way through Congress called the Equality Act. Isn't that a great name, the Equality Act? It has nothing to do with equality. That's uh, right. It says uh, the, the Equality Act would make gender identity and sexual orientation prote protected classes under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So people that say, I am whatever gender, I mean, they're making them up. Uh, and we're, su we're supposed to uh, accommodate them. Now this isn't law yet, but it is the rule in certain establishments, certain institutions, like universities. If I am a university professor teaching a class and I have a student who says, I want you to use these pronouns when you refer to me, 
uh, and you refuse, you might be fired. It has happened. Um, this writer says, to be clear, you should only care about the Equality Act if you are a Christian or a person of any faith or a woman or own a business or run a nonprofit or go to school or teach at school or are a medical or mental health professional or if you are a female athlete or under the age of 18 or ever use a public restroom. If, if you don't fit into any of those categories, you have nothing to fear from the Equality Act. But everybody else is going to uh, going to run up against problems with the Equality Act. If I teach from Genesis chapter 2, say God created them male and female, I could run afoul of the Equality Act because the law is starting to recognize that, well, no, that's not right. That's, there are other genders besides male and female. You can be any gender you want and call it by any name that you want. If you are a surgeon and a 14-year-old girl comes to you and says, I want to be a boy and I, I want you to perform a double mastectomy, because boys don't have breasts, and you refuse, you might run afoul of this law. You may lose your job. And the parents don't have to be notified. And the parents don't have any say in the matter. If they are notified and say, no, you're not going to do that, uh, they the, 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 the state will step in and say, yes, you will. You will accommodate that. Uh, I ran into a situation years ago. It had nothing to do with this law, but it kind of has to do with the thinking that's going on. Uh, I told everybody before that I was a scoutmaster for eight years, and I remember taking the boys to camp. And we had a rule in the camp. Adults could not go to the shower room with the kids. We had kids time for showers, we have adults time for showers. Okay, so far so good. We had a, a number of young kids, you know, 11 year olds, who wouldn't go take a shower. You know, I mean, we're there in the dirt for a week. They refused to go take a shower. And I finally got one of them to tell me why. I mean, they wouldn't talk about it. So, well, there's these 14 and 15 year olds in there that are, um, I, I can't tell you what was, was happening in there. And uh, <clears throat> so I went to uh, the camp authorities and told them about this and they said, well, that's, that's just the rules. That's what we have to go by and there's really nothing we can do about that. You know, and if under this law people uh, men can say, well, I identify as a woman, so I'm going to go in the women's bathroom and I'm going to abuse five-year-old girls. There's not much you can do about it. That's, yeah, that's their orientation. That's the way it is. Uh, says any establishment that provides a good, now this is actually quoting from the law itself, any establishment that provides a good service or program, including a store, shopping center, online realtor, real retailer, or service provider, salon, bank, gas station, food bank, service or care center, shelter, travel agency, or funeral parlor, or establishment that provides health care, accounting, or legal services, along with any organization that receives any federal funding is going to have to comply with this law. Churches are going to have to comply with the law. And fortunately, we don't have any employees. But if we hired a guy, you know, it seems normal and, you know, and he reports to work the next day in a dress with high heels, don't laugh, I've seen this. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. If you do, you're, uh, 
civilly liable, not criminally, civilly liable, meaning that uh, you get sued for big bucks. So that's what's, that's what's coming down the pike. So what, uh, what do we do about it? Well, you, you, well, that's too late. You can call your senator. It hasn't gone to the Senate. It hasn't gone to the Senate yet, so you can call your senator, but the rep representatives have already voted. I know the House of Representatives have. Yeah. So, what, what's more practical, though? Well, just be careful. Don't, you know, I mean, if, if you go in a public restroom and you see a guy in there, get out quick. Um, but there's, you know, basically certain jobs you can't do. You know, I, I couldn't uh, go to the, you know, the local, uh, you know, university and be a professor. I can at the Christian university, but not at, uh, not at a secular school. Just couldn't do it. If they knew who I was, they wouldn't hire me anyway. You know? Uh, you know, if you're looking, you know, and if you're a young person, which we don't have any here, uh, <laughs> but if you were looking to go uh, for a medical degree, de degree a medical career, you'd have to be very careful. Uh, you'd have to pick a specialty where this wouldn't affect you. You definitely could not be a gynecologist because then you might be required to uh, perform sex change operations. Um, you know, this is just the way the thinking of the world is going. Now, the good news is it's not going to last very long. Thank you for some good news. The kingdom of God is coming and will put, put aside, put out of business all unrighteousness. So, but that's the state of where we are. It's no worse than what uh, Paul was dealing with. George? An ancillary to this uh, house bill, this project uh, reset, which is uh, taking all the personal information from your spending habits, those credit cards, or your surfing habits, and all of that, and profiling you, and, uh, and setting your credit score, and your your eligibility for jobs on the basis of whether you were buying guns or bullets or whether you were uh, supporting or not supporting the green industry and if you have stocks in, in, in uh, petrodollars or the pharmaceutical, whatever you have it, you're going to get a score whether mm -hmm. it's politically correct or not and that will determine what you get to do and what you don't get to do. Right. You get to travel. And, and it may uh, affect your retirement. You know, if you're expecting uh, to draw social social security, uh, they they may score you based on on those things to let you know whether you're, they're going to let you have social security or not. They're doing this in China, and and we know several uh, missionaries that have been to China, and uh, they tell us that everybody has a watcher. There's somebody, wherever you go, uh, <clears throat> whether it's the apartment building you live in, the job you go to, there's somebody assigned to watch you and write down your comings and goings and whether they think you're uh, you know, a proper communist and all of that. But they've gotten to the point where they're watching you online as well. And, you know, it's, it's coming to America. What's that? Give us some hope here. It hasn't passed yet, right? <laughs> it hasn't passed yet. It, it eventually will. Or something like it. You know? We just... We we're, gonna, we're going to need to get like the uh, people, uh, the missionaries in Russia uh, that, I, uh, that I've known. And, you know, it, Christianity is an underground church was uh, uh, it's much better now 
much better than it was, but uh, Christians were underground operators, spies. Uh, one uh, story that a guy told me was he was supposed to meet a, a fellow believer on a uh, train platform in, uh, I think it was in Moscow. And he went to this train platform and he just walked along the length of it and didn't find his friend, didn't, didn't see him. And then they had a secondary rendezvous point and he went there later and met him there. And uh, he said, I didn't see you. And uh, he said, well, I didn't look up at you, but you walked right by me. And he said, I had two KGB agents right on my tail. And he said, I didn't want you to recognize me, and the Lord clouded your vision. He said, they arrested me, and they took me to KGB headquarters, uh, which has something like 10 stories underground, under the building. And he said, they took me down to the lowest level, and they put me in an interrogation room, and then they sat down across, and they had a file, and uh, <clears throat> I was getting set to be interrogated, and all of a sudden the guy got a call and left. He said, so I sat there for a while, and he said, uh, and I thought, well, what would happen if I stood up and stood up and nothing happened? He said, well, what would happen if I tried the door? He opened the door, the door was wide open, you know, he opened the door and walked out in the hall. He said, they're going to get me any time here. He said, he got to the stairwell and he walked up the 10 flights of stairs to the street level, and he says, and I just walked out the front door. <laughs> said it was the craziest thing. He said, and here I am now. But uh, if you had recognized me and looked like you recognized me, they would have arrested you too. Uh, but that's how Christians had to operate in the old Soviet Union. And it could happen here. Uh, there are people who would like it to happen here. But the hope is we need to be in God's will all the time. We need to be in prayer uh, for these matters all the time. And we need to be praying that God's kingdom comes all the time. So let's pray. Lord, uh, we... Uh, can, can we look at that last Bible verse we have there? The last Bible verse. Luke 20, 24. And it, um, I just, this is one of my favorite verses. Because if you read it, it says, Whose likeness and image inscription does it have? Well, he's talking about a coin there. Yeah. But if you ask that question about you, you have the likeness in the inscription of God. Amen. We're made in the image and likeness of God. And, and you know, it, it isn't explicit, but amen. Yeah, I that's, like that. That's a good... That's true. Yeah. Lord, we're thankful that we have been made in your image and likeness and we are not to be conformed to the world. And uh, Lord, we pray that you strengthen us in order that uh, um, we can live according to your image and likeness. And Lord, we, uh, uh, Lord, we pray for peace, for shalom. Uh, we pray that, the, uh, that your peace would descend upon this world and we would uh, make it to your kingdom that uh, where in dwells righteousness. Uh, Lord, we pray that your kingdom come soon. And Lord, we know that uh, when you arrive on this earth, that you will put uh, all of these uh, human institutions to shame. And Lord, we pray for people that have bought into the lies of the world, and we pray that you save them. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.